I wanted to play a little audio of George Maxwell a couple years back, so it's still fairly recent, um, praising Manly P. Hall, and uh, it's going to kind of reveal a lot of things, that he was uh, good friends with him, and um, he was a wonderful man. I guess it's not really, uh, I don't know, you can make up your own mind whether you think Manly P. Hall was good or not, but... I have some things also after this that I could quote from Manly P. Hall that shows that he was, well, was it for your best interest when it, when it came to uh, liberty and freedom? He was for a global tyranny, just say that. So anyways, here's Jordan Maxwell. Before we went live, I showed you my uh, new shirt that I had made. Yeah, yeah, man yeah. Of the Hall, yeah, man of You know what I'm saying? The man of mystery, great teacher. Uh, you were talking a little bit about how um, he left you some of his, his work and how you miss him and how he was a great mentor. Yeah, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. I, myself, just my opinion, but I think he was probably one of the greatest teachers this world has ever known in any era of time. One of the great masters of knowledge and wisdom and education that's ever lived on this earth. And I mean, going back into the ancient Grecian Empire, the Grecian uh, Roman Empire, and all the great minds and philosophical teachers of the world, I, I, I know about so much of that history. I cannot fathom in my mind anyone who comes close to the work of Manley Palmer Hall. He was an incredibly brilliant man, and he never promoted any particular religious yeah. belief. He never, he never promoted any particular uh, philosophical or, or political viewpoint at all. What Manly P. Hall did was nothing short of phenomenal. He taught everyone about every religion and concept and philosophy in the whole world as a master. I don't care what it is, and, and from China to, to uh, Japan to Africa to any country in the world, any nation, any race, creed, or color, any belief system, any religion, he was a master in all of it. What an incredible, incredible man he was. And he was a dear friend of mine. And I learned so much from him. And I... That's enough. Anyways, you can catch the whole thing. It's about 10 minutes. It's. You see that? Hopefully you can. My phone here is cracked. <laughs> I dropped it at work on its screen. I feel like a dumbass. Anyways. So... Jordan Maxwell speaks on Manly P. Hall's death and their relationship. So, he says a lot more. It's ten minutes long. He says he was a wonderful, wonderful man. And, you know, you can have your opinions on what happened when he died. Uh, some people believe that he was murdered, actually murdered by the uh, Illuminati or whatnot. By the rulers. For maybe revealing too much secrets. I don't know. What's interesting about that is, you know, after his death, uh, Mason still, uh, you know, considered him the greatest Masonic uh, researcher, historian, and, um, and we know that's part of the Illuminati, so, and he was very pro-Illuminati in his own writings and stuff, but he makes some interesting statements in a book that I had bought from him. This is more of a political book. Fight the Future. A New Theory of Political Representation. Manly P. Hall. He says he promotes a lot of... He promotes big government socialism in this book, anyways. He promotes a, a, a global police force, the New World Order. And we don't really 
it's not a shock because you know there's been plenty of research that shows in his own writings that he did that all the time but this one is uh, revealing because it, it's just he, he he says a few times things that you know make you think how can he be a this uh, great guy he sounds like a big government tyrant but anyways he says he had a big problem with what he called individualism you know people and individuals can you know private property people owning private property or pushed government control of industry and media and, and just basically everything and uh, anyways on page 17 of the book he compares the rugged individualism of you know that's so represented in in our way of life and here with the uh, and he, you know, with our freedom and, and constitution, he calls it rugged individualism. And he says, quote, rugged individualism is nothing but glorified savagery. In the words of one of our real 100% Americans, quote, the red man was called a savage because he scalped his enemies. But the white man who calls himself civilized skins his friends. And I'll probably do a future video where I'm reading from this book just to show. It says uh, further on, the next page, page 18, quote, A man is not necessarily a citizen of a country because he is born there. Many a native-born son who is a, is a more dangerous alien than the immigrant who comes from afar. Such a man should earn his citizenship rights by his contribution to the well-being of the community and not secure them by the mere accident of birth. Nor is a man a desirable citizen simply because he has memorized the Declaration of Independence, read the Constitution, or knows which way to drape a flag on legal holidays. No man who lives and dies for himself alone has any right to partake of such common good as civilization confers. And what he's getting at here is, uh, because his whole argument in this very first chapter is, people need to start uh, working for the common good and that's usually socialist words describing the uh, coming together in a interdependent community coming together you know and um, both nationally and internationally but uh, sacrificing the rugged individualism of uh, you know what our old ways used to be under the Constitution, uh, Declaration of Independence, the right to for you to just live on your own ground and you know live your own way and you know he had a problem with this and he uh, said that uh, according to him you did not have a right to basically be a part of the nation because uh, you know you're too selfish and socialist what they consider as selfish is people who want to live you know basically outside of the community or <laughs> people who want to own their own private property and work for their own you know own their own business without government or you know owning it whatever so you would you know I'll skip to the last one of the last pages of this book calls for a new world order of course it's no surprise page 146 the international nation if once if once created would become so interdependent that it would be impossible for its parts ever to separate and engage in warfare with the international nation a reality millions spent annually for the great powers of the earth to maintain their armaments could be largely directed to the actual development of the human race. The international nation would require no armaments. A sufficient policing system could be created by which minor factions that might insist on belligerent, belligerent attitudes could be quickly brought into line. This international army of police could be made up of a certain number of selected men from each nation. And he goes on a little bit further down the page. This is page 146, by the way. If for any reason a nation should insist upon retiring from the international nation and wish to withdraw its troops from the international police, it should be at liberty to do so. But no nation could hope to stand out against the solid body of the whole. So if a nation doesn't want to be a part of 
the new, you know, the global order and wants to uh, wants to maintain its national sovereignty. Uh, basically, what he's saying here is it would not be able to survive; it would suffer greatly without being a part of the international nation or the new world order. Anyways, um, nope. I mean, I might make it a thing to read this book since it's just not widely popular. But it's a, it's a good one. It reveals Manly P. Hall's, you know, big government tyranny mindset. And, uh... His uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages, he uh, again um, talks about this coming new world. It's on the chapter, The Hieromic Legend of Freemasonry. This is on page uh, 247. Quote, When the mob governs, man is ruled by ignorance. When the church governs, he is ruled by superstition. When the state governs, he is ruled by fear. Before men can live together in harmony and understanding, ignorance must be transmuted into wisdom, superstition, into an illumined faith. He's talking about the, you know, the coming, you know, new world religion, illumined faith. And fear into love. Despite statements to the contrary, masonry is a religion seeking to unite God and man by elevating its initiates to that level of consciousness wherein they can behold with clarified vision the workings of the great architect of the universe. From age to age, the vision of a perfect civilization is preserved as the ideal for mankind. In the midst of that civilization shall stand a mighty university, wherein both the sacred and secular sciences concerning the mysteries of life will be freely taught to all who will assume the philosophic life. Here, creed and dogma will have no place. The superficial will be removed, and only the essential be preserved. The world will be ruled by its most illumined minds, the Illuminati, and each will occupy the position for which he is most admirably fitted. The great university will be divided into grades, a mission to which will be through preliminary, preliminary tests or initiations. Here mankind will be instructed in the most sacred, most secret, most enduring of all mysteries, symbolism. Here the initiate will be taught that every visible object, every abstract thought, every emotional reaction is but the symbol of an eternal principle. And he goes on a little bit further. Down on the next page, on page 248. The perfect government of the earth must be patterned eventually after that divine government by which the universe is ordered. In that day when perfect order is reestablished, with peace and universal and good triumphant, men will no longer seek for happiness, for they shall find it welling up within themselves. And the very last thing he says down here, Then shall sages sit upon the seats of the mighty, and the gods walk with men. Blah, blah, blah. But anyways, you know, his peace to him, and when you get into, like, this stuff here, this book here, is, you know, when the government basically runs everything, when, you know, the United Nations, basically, you know, his international nation, you know, is taken over the sovereignty of all nations, nation states, and um, forcefully uh, seized all the arms of all those nations, and creates a world police, and uh, yeah, peace to him is world socialism, it's world uh, communism, really. So, I don't know, Manly P. Hall, isn't it Jordan Maxwell called him a uh, good, wonderful friend, with, well, a man with wisdom, and you know, uh, just uh, just blah, blah, blah. Great, great, great guy. And Jordan Maxwell, right? He was one of the godfathers of the truth movement. And people like to separate the Jordan Maxwell from the other guys by saying, well, Jordan Maxwell, you know, yeah, he was a shill, but Alex Jones wasn't. Some people do say that. He, the Bill Cooper fans will say, well, that's Jordan Maxwell. Bill Cooper, however, is different. And, you know, and yes, Bill Cooper did call out Jordan Maxwell attacking Christianity. But, you know, Bill Cooper 
subtly did it himself in a sneaky way. He, uh, you know, said many things that, you know, I won't get into that here. Uh, anyways, point is, is again, I'm pointing out, proving more and more red flags and just so much evidence. Yeah, the, the truth movement, it's you know, Masonic, it's fake, it's, it's a... It's another uh, deception, obviously, from the Brotherhood. and Well, from Jordan Maxwell's own words. Alrighty, take care. Have a good one.